I'm John Schlipp for those of you that uh, I haven't uh, dealt with or, or been to any of my other lectures. I'm one of the uh, large animal internists here. So that's what uh, my specialty is. Rocky Baker back here, who's in our uh, diagnostic lab. So if there's any specific questions on uh, some of the diagnostics that we're going to talk about this evening that I'm unable to answer or make up something that's plausible, I'll have Rocky try to fill in. The OSU lab does all the testing, okay? So you can drop them off here and, and have the information that same day. So important information to know. So anyhow, I've been asked this evening to speak on, um, oh, that's right, herpes, herpes, that's right. So, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so what I'm going to try to do this evening <coughs> is give you the, the best information I can as far as just an update on what we know about equine herpes and specifically the equine herpes myelencephalopathy the neurologic form of, of herpes, okay? So we'll brush on the other forms or the diseases that we oftentimes see with herpes, but this is what we're gonna focus on is the neurologic form this evening. <clears throat> so these are the things that we'll try to cover the, just briefly on most of these things because otherwise we could spend an entire week talking about these. But Talk about the herpes virus in general as far as the different viruses that are there, how it's transmitted, which is really important when we start looking at how are we going to control it or prevent the spread in uh, barns, et cetera. Look at what the clinical disease and how we make the diagnosis, some of the treatment considerations, and unfortunately, that's going to be the shortest portion of this talk just because we don't have a lot of options at this point. Important aspect, control and prevention strategies, and we'll spend more time on that and then try to answer your questions at the end as far as uh, what I've brought up. <clears throat> so I realize that uh, they've looked at studies and the attention span of most adults is about six minutes. So I'm going to get to the take home message, the cut to the chase right to begin with, so that if by the end, these are the important things, okay? So there is a mutation of the equine herpes virus one and it's a neurotropic sort of uh, mutation, but what we'll get into more in more detail is that the neurologic form, you do not have to have this mutation for the neurologic form to develop, okay? But as we'll find out, there may be increased incidence when this mutation is present. Latency and, and thus recrudescence of the disease is really important with herpes, just like any other herpes in humans or otherwise that it is hidden in your body and stress will bring it out and cause the disease to become present. Cold sores, I think we can all associate with that. Some very common sense sort of precautions that we'll talk about as far as prevention within the hospital and as well in barns, show stables, et cetera. Talk about the isolation procedures that uh, we feel are important and that you should try to institute in your, your stable. One important thing, this is a real important point as far as trying to monitor or prevent or look at the, the, the disease as far as when it might be beginning to show itself is checking the temperature daily. Very important. Good hygiene, common sense is going to be really important as far as reducing the spread. And then we'll get into a controversial area as far as vaccinations. Okay. So the herpes virus itself. There's about nine different herpes viruses that have been identified. You can see the different ones. One through five are the ones that most commonly infect horses. Six through eight infect donkeys. Nine infect zebras. And this genetic mutation leads to this high risk neuropathic variant. And that's the one that we're concerned about as far as it leads to the development of these neurologic signs that we're, we're going to talk about. But again, it's not the only form of the virus that can lead to these neurologic forms. So I like to look at the, the neurotropic virus as sort of as that approach as far as its severity and what it can do with regards to the, the neuro nervous system. So the syndromes that we look at when we think about herpes, there's really three basic ones that we look at. Respiratory form, and that's typically in the young horses, so the two-year-old or less. 
Okay, we don't typically see that in adult horses. Abortions, okay, we see that in any age mares, typically occurs in the third trimester. And the neurologic disease, of course, is the one that we're going to focus on this evening, and that's the other clinical syndrome that we see associated with equine herpes virus 1. So as far as the clinical signs that you're going to see with herpes virus, the classic signs are what we talk about here. So mild incoordination up to very severe sort of signs to the point this animal is unable to rise, so complete recumbency. So you're going to see the full spectrum. You can't say, well, this is herpes because it's this severe or it's not herpes because it's only mild. You can see anything from just mild incoordination to, again, a horse that's unable to stand. We see hind limb signs more commonly or more severely as far as the signs you're going to see. So those hind limbs are going to be affected more. We see loss of tail tone, see loss of bladder function. So these horses may be dribbling urine. We oftentimes see in geldings where they're unable to retract their penis as a result of the paralysis, okay? We rarely see these central signs. So these horses are bright and alert. They're just stumbling around and unable to recognize where their feet are at, but it rarely affects them centrally. Okay. It's not impossible, but we rarely see that. Again, these animals are usually bright and alert, but this is one of the classic sort of signs, the dog sitting because they're unable to rise. Their front legs are working better than their hind limbs, so a recumbent animal as far as that. Anytime we deal with recumbency in a large animal, it doesn't make any difference what the underlying disease is, it's a very poor prognosis. Okay. So if we can keep these animals standing or we can support them in a sling, we have a chance. Once they're recumbent and we can't support them, then the complications become much more of a difficult challenge to us and become more of an issue for survival than the primary disease, especially with herpes. Because as we'll talk about with the treatment, a lot of these, if you just support them and give them time, they will start to respond without any specific treatment, okay? So what leads to the signs that we see? What, what is this virus doing that's actually causing the clinical signs, okay? So viremia is a necessary aspect of the, the, the pathogenesis of the disease, of the development. So we have to have viral particles in the bloodstream. That's what viremia is, okay? So that's a necessary aspect of it. So this virus, the, the EHV1, is what we call endothelial tropic. And what that means is that it has a propensity for the vasculature, okay? The endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessels, okay? So it has a, a propensity or a fondness for that, that it, it attacks or wants to be there, okay? So it damages that microvasculature, the small blood vessels that go to the spinal cord. And with that damage, we lose blood supply to per particular areas of the spinal cord. As Soon as that spinal cord loses blood supply, it begins to die, okay? So that is the, that's the underlying pathogenesis or the underlying effects of this virus as far as within the spinal cord. It's damaging the blood vessels. It's not actually damaging the spinal cord itself, okay? It's just the blood vessels itself that, it, that supply the, the spinal cord that are being damaged. And that's what happens in abortions as well, is that the, the virus is damaging the blood supply to the placenta and we get a loss of blood supply and thus the abortion. Okay? So again, the spinal cord is what's going to be most commonly affected and depending again on the, the, the viral load, the number of blood vessels that are damaged or affected is going to lead to the clinical signs that you're going to see as far as the severity, okay? We very rarely see the brainstem being affected, and that would be the horse that would be dull, would be uptunded, would be showing central signs. Most of the time they're bright, they're wanting to eat, they're doing everything except for they're just not connected with their legs, okay? Now when we look at the the actual incidence of this disease when we compare it to some other diseases, and the one I mentioned up here are abortion outbreaks, when we've experienced those with herpes, you can expect about 50% occurrence as far as the, the, the true outbreak as far as showing those sort of signs or having those problems. 
you can see that only about 10% of the horses that become infected with herpes virus, one, even the, the neurologic form of the herpes virus, only about 10% of those are actually going to develop clinical signs. So you can see it's, it's, it's a, a low incidence, but if it's your horse, it's 100%. I, all the numbers I give you right now, you don't care. If it happens to your horse, it's 100%. So th th this plays into when we start looking at our testing and some of our preventative measures and all. It's a low incidence, but it's still a serious disease to be reckoned with. <clears throat> but certainly better than what we deal with with abortion outbreaks. So these are a couple of the questions that <clears throat> we get very commonly. Okay. So is there a particular strain that causes the neurologic disease? No. Okay, so that's really important. There is not one strain that causes the neurologic disease. However, there is that one mutation that's more commonly associated with the development of neurologic disease. But if you test the horse and you come back with the, the test that says it's not the neurologic form, it can still cause the neurologic form. Okay. So that's always the confusion is when we start testing it, you find you get the, the PCR results, and we'll get to that here in a minute. You get the results back, and it says, well, it's not, the, it's not the mutation, not the neurologic mutation. How can my horse have the neurologic form? It can have it without having that mutation, okay? So that's important. Are all outbreaks of the neurologic disease caused by the mutation? No, okay? The variant that causes abortions has been associated with causing neurologic disease as well. About 15 to 25 percent of the neurologic cases is from the non-neurologic mutation. <clears throat> so why do we see that some horses develop the, the herpes neurologic form? And others just develop a fever. Others develop the respiratory form. And if they're mares, why do some develop the problem as far as an abortion? <clears throat> we don't know. That's the bottom line. We don't understand the full interaction as far as the virus itself and what it's doing, as well as the immune system, the horse's immune system and how it's responding. Those things together, that interaction leads to why some of these develop it and why we have this low incidence as far as only 10% that developed the neurologic form. The level of viremia has been considered as a factor that may be involved. And the reason that we see this or they believe this may be a, a problem is that typically these horses that develop the neurologic form have a much higher level as far as the viral load when we look at the blood. Okay, if we're measuring the viral particles, they have a much higher viral load than just the respiratory forms. On the flip side of that, we also see horses develop the neurologic form that don't always have that heavy viral load. But there is at least a belief that that may be associated with it. Older horses <coughs> are generally more susceptible. Okay? There's a number of studies that have looked at that and have shown, and these are, these are retrospective studies where they've gone and looked as far as following up on these cases, and the older horses seem to be more commonly involved. And the belief is probably something with their immune system being different than in the younger horse. But that being said, any age is susceptible. So you can't just say, well, it's a young horse, so again, it can't possibly be, or it's an old horse, so it has to be. But the older horses are more susceptible. So the factors that contribute to the development of the herpes, we really don't understand entirely. So I can't give you a clear-cut picture this evening as far as this is what's happening, this is what we're going to be doing to try to prevent it. We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm.